So this is part five of our series together going through the book of Galatians. And as we began the second chapter last week, we saw the issue of spies in the church and spies in this war over the gospel. And today we are going to see compromise in the church and an issue of compromise in the gospel war. And as we begin, I want to remind you that small compromises can have big consequences. I want you to hear that again. Small compromises can have large consequences in our lives. A boat that sails just a few degrees off will end up miles away from its original destination. Again, small compromises big consequences in our lives. There's a Russian parable, the story of a hunter and a bear. And in this parable, a Russian hunter raised his rifle and he took careful aim at a very large bear and he was about to pull the trigger when the bear shocked him by speaking in a soft and soothing voice. Isn't it better to talk than to shoot? What do you want from me? Come, let us negotiate. Well, according to this Russian parable, the hunter lowered his rifle and said to the bear, all I want is a fur coat. The bear said, that is good. That is a reasonable request. You want a fur coat and all I want is a full stomach. Let's see if we can make a compromise. So they sat down to compromise. And after a time, the bear walked away alone. The negotiation had been, of course, very successful. The bear had a full stomach, and the hunter had his fur coat. Think on that one. Now, compromise can be fine at times. What I mean by that is it can, it can be fine in solving disputes between friends or employees or spouses or concerning politicians or even enemies. There is a definition of compromise that is to come to agreement by mutual concession. It's fine and fair to have that kind of compromise in your life. However, the second definition of compromise is what we're talking about today. That is to make a dishonorable or shameful concession in your life. Dishonorable or shameful concession is deadly to our souls when it becomes a means to disobey and dishonor our sovereign Lord, God, and Creator. When we start to see gaps that develop, even if they're just small gaps between our private lives and our public words, between our personal beliefs and our public lifestyle, compromise exists. You better count on it. And compromise always leads to cover up. And when we start to dwell in darkness in our personal lives, we have been compromised. In fact, D.L. Moody once said, "His character is what you are in the dark when no one's looking. So again, I say to you that small compromises can have big consequences, especially when it comes to the things of our God. So let's read together Galatians 2, beginning at verse 11. Paul writes here, now when Peter had come to Antioch, I withstood him to his face because he was to be blamed. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. But when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews also played the hypocrite with him, so that even Barnabas was carried away with their hypocrisy. But when I saw that they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all, if you, being a Jew, live in the matter of Gentiles and not as the Jews, why do you compel Gentiles to live as Jews? We who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Jesus Christ. Even we have believed in Christ Jesus 
that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law, no flesh shall be justified. May the Lord bless the reading of his holy and inspired and inerrant word. We are here in Galatians 2, and all of a sudden, Peter's name is brought up again. Now, we've already seen Peter in Galatians 1. If you remember, after Paul was saved, in Galatians 1, 18 and 19, we saw that Paul went to Peter, and they had fellowship for some days, and it was a good, positive meeting. Last week in Galatians chapter 2, we saw that years later, about 14 years after Paul's salvation, he went to Jerusalem, and he met with the pillars of the church in Jerusalem. One of those leaders was Peter, and they agreed with one another. In fact, there was such good camaraderie between Peter and Paul that the church in Jerusalem gave Paul the right hand of fellowship. They blessed him in his ministry. They encouraged him that they had the same gospel They were doing the same work. They were just reaching different people, most beautifully. But now when we come into this verse, something has changed. Compromise has crept in. The public words of Peter and his private life are all of a sudden not congruent anymore. Now, we moved from Jerusalem last week to now the very important city of the early church, Antioch. In fact, we know there are still Antiochian Christians in the world. This is a very historic and ancient church going back to the first century. Antioch was the capital of Syria, and it was a home to a very large Jewish community. And if you remember in the book of Acts, this was the first place where Jewish Christians preached the gospel to non-Jews, to Gentiles in Acts chapter 11. And this city was the first place where Christians were called by that name. They were first called Christians in the city of Antioch. So this is a very unique city. It's multicultural. It's multi-ethnic. First place where people of different ethnicities, different backgrounds are coming together to worship the same Lord Jesus Christ. Surely, what we read about here was a very awkward moment in the life of Christianity. It's always embarrassing and hard when a disagreement occurs, but especially if it were to happen in the place of peace, in the place of God's church. It was especially hard because it happened during a church meal where there's supposed to be joy and celebration and fellowship and love among the body. Even worse, the two participants at odds were leaders of the church, apostles, two men who have gotten along wonderfully in the past, in Peter and Paul. So notice what Paul says here in verse 11. He says, I withstood Peter to the face. In other words, Paul was true to what he said in chapter 1, verse 10. I do not seek to please men. This was a confrontation that needed to happen. Paul says here, I openly opposed him. There was a public issue here. Paul showed, number one, he was equal and apostolic authority with Peter. If you remember the earlier weeks in this series, we saw how some of the false teachers were saying that Paul was not a real apostle. Peter was. We see that they stood as equals amongst one another. But there is also something else going on here. I think the principle of Proverbs 27, verse 6, is what we should think of when we read this passage. The writer of this wisdom passage says, Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but profuse are the kisses of an enemy. What I mean when I say we should think of this is that a true friend is willing to help us even if it will hurt us momentarily. Listen, all correction doesn't feel good. If you go back to your childhood, you know that, right? When your parents corrected you, it was momentarily displeasurable. Hence why Kids hide paddles and hide their bottoms, right? Most kids are expert at both of these things naturally. However, while the correction may not feel good, as genuine wounds won't, it's an expression of love and faithfulness of the friend. In fact, the Bible tells us those whom the Lord loves, he corrects. 
Again, this is why children don't just hide their bottoms, they hide their sin. They try to keep it secret because they don't want groundings, they don't want correction. By the way, we sometimes do the very same things as adults, don't we? We like to run from what we need. And so we'll find a new church rather than deal with the problem. We'll find new friends rather than deal with the problem. We'll find a new job rather than deal with the problem. John Gill writes this about Paul here. He says, Paul didn't go about as a talebearer or as a whisperer or as a backbiter, but he came to Peter and reproved him to his face, freely spoke his mind to him, boldly resisted him, honestly endeavored to convince him of his mistake and to put to a stop to his compromise, his wrong conduct. He did not withstand him as an enemy. He was not rude. He didn't have ill manners. I love this here. Remember, the whole issue in Galatia, if you've been in our series, is that these false agitators have come into the church of Galatia and they, behind Paul's back, are criticizing him. They are talebearers. They are slanderers. They are whispering secretly terrible things, lies against Paul and his reputation. That's not how Paul does business, and that's not how godly Christians do business. We have seen that if there is an issue, you go to the person first. We don't go to everyone else first and that person last. And when I read this principle here, I think Paul is saying, I did not speak evil of Peter like these agitators have spoke evil of me. I went directly to him because he was self-condemned. Compromise had come into his life. He was acting contrary to his beliefs. Now, here's what I want you to hear. When you act contrary to your beliefs, you cause harm to the Christian faith. Let me say it again a different way. When your words and your actions don't meet up, you cause pain to the Christian walk and shame to your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. See, your actions can undo your words. Compromise usually starts with our actions, not with our words. We still talk a good talk, but we don't walk a very good walk. It starts small, but it leads to big consequences. James says in chapter 2 of his letter, what good is it, brothers and sisters, if someone says he has faith, but he does not have works? Can that faith say him? You see that faith was active all along with his works, and faith is completed by his works. In other words here, I want to encourage you, if you're feeling that compromise in your life right now, if you're saying, there are certain things I say I believe that I'm not living, there are certain actions I'm doing that don't match up with what God's word says, and what I know to be true and right in the depths of my soul, this is a sermon to be challenged. This is a day to do some spiritual inventory in your heart and not just be content to have the faith here and here, but to live that faith outside of you Monday through Saturday. There's too many marriages that look good on Sunday morning and they don't look so good Monday through Saturday. There's too many employees that are bold Christians on Sunday, but it seems that Christian character disappears within the 24-hour cycle when Monday morning hits. There's too many parents that bring their kids to church on Sunday, but they're not leading them to Christ on Monday. We need to think about these kind of things this morning. Now, this controversy and compromise is going to be very racial in nature. It's going to be about relationships in the church of God ethnically. It's going to be about how we in the church relate to one another, ethnically and as Christians. Now understand that there are ethnic churches in the world, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. Sometimes we need ethnic churches because of language needs. Sometimes there's ethnic churches simply because there's only one ethnicity in a community. But ethnicity is not meant to divide us In fact, all throughout Scripture, we see the very opposite. It is meant to unite us under a common Lord, a common Savior, whose blood died for the peoples of the world. 
And the issue here is not going to be about whether it's okay to have an ethnic church or not. The issue is going to be, do you not want to have fellowship with people because of their ethnicity? Do you carry hatred in your heart? Do you look down on others because of their background? So notice the issue in verse 12 is about eating. It's about food, which is great because we're Baptists. This is something we all like to do, right? So let's examine ourselves today. Eating is a cultural event. What we eat and the people we eat with say something about who we are. It's so funny how I've noticed even today, some parents post more pictures of the meals that they go out to eat than the children that they take with them to enjoy the meals. What does that say about us as a people? Sometimes certain types of people refuse to eat with other certain types of people. We don't want to be seen with them. I know of people who will get up and leave a restaurant when they see someone they don't want to talk with. They don't want to be around. Listen, these aren't new problems to us today. Dining and dietary habits were an issue for a church like Antioch in the first century. This city was a huge city, half a million people, 10% Jewish, a cultural melting pot. You had all different types of Syrians and Jews and Romans, and the list goes on and on, all different types of ethnic peoples in this city. So think from a Jewish perspective for a minute. How could Jewish Christians keep their Jewish kosher laws if they had to eat with Gentiles who like shrimp and pork. Amen, right? Now, it's easy to start to try to pick on them, but I want to stop for just a moment and make it a little more personal. Who have you eaten with at the church, Klondike Church, recently? If the answer is no one, whether intentionally or unintentionally, I want to call on you to pay attention to this text for sure. You might be acting like Peter here. What do I mean by that? I'm going to explain in a minute. Notice it says that certain people came from James and he would eat with the Gentiles before they came. In other words, Peter would eat meals with everyone in the church. He loved to be invited over someone's house for a meal after service. When the church met together for a community meal on Sunday morning, he was like some of you uh, crazy extroverts in the room. He couldn't just stay put in one table. He had to bounce around and say hi to everybody. And the rest of us introverts have to fight right to leave our table and smile at somebody else. But no, Peter was all over the map. He had no problem eating with everybody. Not only at church potlucks, ordinary meals, and even at the Lord's Supper. Now I want to remind you here that it is hypocrisy... To do what Peter did here, it is compromise. And I want to challenge you that there's some applications in 2022 that we might be doing the same thing. Remember what the Pharisees said of Jesus. The Pharisees said of Jesus in Luke chapter 15, it says there, this man receives sinners and he what? He eats with them, right? Their criticism of Jesus was that Jesus would dare to eat meals with sinners, which what they meant by that, because they're sinners too, right? They meant people that don't look like us, act like us, talk like us. People that have different customs than us. How dare Jesus sit at a table and eat with them? Now listen, Peter himself had struggled with this issue in the past. Before the people from Jerusalem, from the church at Jerusalem, had come to Antioch, Peter also had an issue with this. If you go back into church history, God had called Peter to go witness to his first non-Jewish convert, a man by the name of Cornelius. Now, Cornelius was not a Jew. He was one of those pesky Italians, all right? He was a Roman, and he was of the Italian regiment. And when I say pesky, I don't mean for us. I mean for the first century Jew, Remember, Rome conquered Israel. They were not necessarily 
fond of Romans. Now, Peter would never in his old life have considered going into the home of a Roman. But God gave Peter a clear word on the matter in a vision. Plus, Jesus said to Peter and to us, go into the whole what? The whole world and preach the gospel to all of creation. Preach it to everybody. So he needed to go. So this is what Peter says. This was years earlier in Acts chapter 10. He's speaking to Cornelius, his first non-Jewish convert. And he says, you yourself know how unlawful it is for a Jew to associate with or to visit anyone of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any person common or unclean. And then we see Peter, what does he do? He preaches, the, he goes in the home. He preaches the gospel to them. And even cre- crazier, he breaks all of the Jewish superstition and he eats a meal with them. That's what Acts chapter 11 verse says. And guess what? He ticks all the people off that are super religious and not right with God because he does that. And then he says in Acts 10, I understand that God shows no partiality. In every nation, anyone who fears and does what is right is acceptable to him. In other words, it's not your skin color. It's not your ethnicity that saves you. It's not how you were born the first time. You need to be born again. You need a new heart. You need a new family, God's family. That doesn't stop you from being whatever your ethnicity is that God gave you. It just makes you complete. Because now you've got an eternal family that won't fail you. So, Peter eats and drinks with the Gentiles. He knows he's not sinning. He knows it's right for him to do so. He's doing that in Antioch. And then the problem erupts. Compromise comes into Peter's heart. Some of the Jews who were outward converts to Jerusalem, professed they were Christians, came to visit Antioch. And these guests showed up in the church on Sunday morning. They were newcomers. And they must have been well-known people. And they had decided that they were not going to follow what Jesus had said. You know, it's interesting. All throughout Galatians, we're going to see there's people that name Jesus' name who don't act like Jesus. And I've been trying to point that out. There are people who call themselves Christians that act nothing like Christ. And that's exactly what's going on here. These men come into the church. Now, last week we saw the issue with circumcision. This week we see it's the ceremonial law and Jewish superstition. So some of the ceremonial laws in the Old Testament of the Jews included the sacrifices for sin. We know the Jews had to make sacrifices at Jerusalem. The feast of Israel, keeping those celebrated feast days. The physical act of circumcision. The duties of the priest in the tabernacle and later the temple. And then the dietary laws. You can't eat pork, you can't eat shellfish. The cleanliness code, the holiness code. All of these laws we read about in the Old Testament. Now, why do we not keep those today as Christians? We are not bound to keep them Because there is no more temple, because there is no more earthly, ironic priesthood. Jesus' body was the temple. He died and rose again on the third day, and he makes us his body, the church. Because Jesus was not just a lamb, but the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. All of those laws ceremonially in the Old Testament find their fulfillment in Jesus Christ, the one who kept the laws perfectly. If you want to see Jesus, read the ceremonial laws. They all point forward to him and are completed in him. So let's make it clear here and start to apply this. Food can be refused biblically for biblical reasons. There's reasons why not to eat something biblically. Number one, out of Christian love, not to offend the weaker brother. That's a big one. In other words, Let's say if someone struggles with, let's use one of the biblical examples, alcohol, right? If they have a struggle with alcohol and drunkenness and intoxication and addiction, you sure as well best not be having alcoholic drinks around them, right? Why? Because you could be tempting them to fall into sin. That's a very biblical, 
easy to understand principle. Out of Christian love, you would do this. Or what if someone is fasting? Someone has chosen not to eat because they are worshiping God and seeking God's face through fasting. You don't have a right to mess with them, to try to get them to eat, to try them to stop fasting. You should encourage them if they're seeking God in that season of life. A second reason about food being refused. You can refuse food in a blasphemous way. Now, while you're not required to keep kosher laws, the Old Testament laws, they were completed in Jesus, we're going to see in a minute. Some people in some modern movements, in particular, um, some of the Hebrew roots type of Christian movements, are calling Christians and putting Christians under bondage to say, you must keep these Old Testament laws, they were not completed in Christ, in order to earn God's favor and righteousness. Now, if you want to keep a kosher life, have at it. If you want to be vegan, vegetarian, have at it. Again, if you are and you tell me that, I'm not going to put a, a big fat steak in front of you, okay? I'm not going to put the Baptist bird chicken in front of you on Sunday morning if you come over to my house, if you tell me you're vegan or vegetarian. The gospel bird will not be put in front of you and we will not sing, I'll fly away, I promise. All right? Not going to happen. I'm going to respect you in your dietary meal issues as a Christian. I'm not going to mock you or make light of you. You're welcome to do that and have those diets. But if you demand that we have a kind of diet like that because it makes you more spiritual or makes you closer to God or makes your faith stronger, then you have undone what Jesus done on the cross. What you eat does not make you more spiritual ever. Now how you eat might, but what you eat doesn't. That's what the Bible is clear about. Now, there's a third way about food being refused that could be wrong. And this is our modern application, probably in our church more so. Because you don't want to associate with other people. Because you think you're better than others. Because you want to keep them at arm's length. Because you're sinful, self-righteous, or, here's a big one, selfish behavior. It's the modern church in 2022, not just at Klondike, I mean all across the board. And we need to fix this. The church was known as a people who were a family and ate together. Now we do that corporately. Usually once a month we do that. And if COVID just continues to stay away, hallelujah, we'll be back on track for doing that regularly. We're having one next month, so I'm excited to get back on track again. We we keep getting back on track, right? The church should do that together together as a family, but we should also do it as families, as the family of God. So, um, you know, I'm just looking out in the audience right now. I could think about uh, eating the Christian bird with the Russells, Chick-fil-A, you know, maybe a year back. That was fun. We did that. And uh, Julia Butler makes a killer pot roast. I'm just saying as I look out and I see Matt back there and uh, him and I have downed some Fusaklis many a times together, haven't we, Matt? And then Brother Tommy, if you go over his house, he's got the rock. This guy's got, uh, you know, like a life-size grill. I mean, this massive thing. And anything thrown down on there is good. He calls it the rock. So I'm just saying. Like, I can look out in the congregation and I can think about meals I've eaten with people in this church. And hopefully you can think about that. You know, and, and it matters. You know, the Alagonas, they taught me this little trick uh, when you make your coffee with your mug, how to heat the mug up first when I was over there a place, all right? See the Ebersoles back there. They laid out Miss Mary. They all laid out this huge, massive spread for us one time. Thank you, Lord Jesus. All right. Um, can you say that about anyone here? And, you know, I, I'm not going to start telling you people have been over our place, but we should be trying to do that as a community. It's important to not keep each other at arm's length. Now, there's reasons why we can at times, health reasons, home reasons. I get it, right? But this should be the norm of the church. That should be the norm of the church, that we are a family connected together. And sometimes I think in 2022, it's not just because we think down on others. It's more that we're selfish in ourselves because it's an inconvenience. It's more time. It takes preparation. But oh, the joy that comes when we actually act like the family of God, when we really love one another that way. 
Sometimes it's messy, sometimes it's inconvenient, but oh, it is a blessing to our souls when we get that time together. And by the way, you know what happens? It makes worship that much better. Because now we don't just have a Sunday morning relationship. It goes a little farther than that. Amen and amen. Now, what happened here? Peter, when these Christians showed up, he withdrew and he separated himself. He acted one way before and now he's acting another way. He does an about face and he stops fellowshipping with them. Now, the word separate here was a military term. It was used of a military withdrawal, pulling back from the front lines. That's what he did. He at one time had close relationships and he began to put everyone at arm's length. We're going to see because he was worried what other people thought. Because he was worried what other people thought. So when you read this here, I think he started to compromise. How does compromise happen? Number one, it happens when we fail to commit ahead of time to do the right thing. Listen, he knew these people were coming. He should have committed. I don't care what people think of me. Daniel, I'm going to purpose in my heart. I'm going to do the right thing and let the chips fall where they may. Compromise happens when we don't make the decision before we get into the moment. Too many of us make decisions at the moment because we haven't purposed in our hearts beforehand where we will stand. So if you're not ready and the trial comes, that doesn't give you an excuse to do the wrong thing. The Holy Spirit's with you. But oh, it makes it so much easier to do the right thing if you purpose in your heart. Secondly, by underestimating how small compromises have big consequences. By flirting with temptation. By failing to recognize sin is crouching at every door. And if sin can just get its foot in the door just a little bit, it can have huge, devastating results in your soul. To just, just play with it, pridefully having confidence in your own strength. I'll only let these, I'll only keep them at arm's length just while these people are around. I'm only going to sit on the other side of the sanctuary for a little while. I'm only going to harbor unforgiveness in my heart for a little while. I'm only going to do it my way for a little while. I'll get back right eventually. Well, that's how bitterness creeps in. A root of bitterness grows and it springs up out of the ground and messes everything up. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 12 says, Let anyone who thinks he stands takes heed lest he falls. So all of a sudden, sin has taken over. Peter's not eating over people's homes anymore. He's not sitting at the same tables with the Gentiles anymore. He's only sitting with the people who look like him, act like him, these Jews from Jerusalem. And maybe even during the Lord's Supper, he's refusing to take communion with people that are not like him. That is devastating to hear. I won't ever go to a church with people like that, that look like that, that act like that. Little compromises lead to big changes. Listen, Satan didn't encourage Adam and Eve to become serial killers. He just told them to eat of the tree. Which, by the way, that little bite had big consequences. It brought death into humanity. He makes the compromise look small, but the consequences are often enormous. They're often enormous. Listen, this is the kind of behavior that dominated Peter's life before the resurrection. This is like Peter taking his eyes off Jesus and beginning to sink in the water. This is like Peter telling Jesus, you're not going to go to the cross. I'm not going to allow it. This is like Peter denying Jesus three times. This is like Peter cutting off the servant Malchus's ear when they came to arrest Jesus. I think we see here the flesh is still present in Peter. And even the greatest Christians can fall into sin sometimes more than once. Just because Peter was saved and sanctified doesn't mean he didn't wrestle with sin. So you who think you stand, take heed lest you fall. Even great Christians can fall into sin. Martin Luther said here, no man standing is so secure that he may not fall. 
If Peter fell, I may fall. If he rose again, I may rise again. We have the same gifts they had, the same Christ, the same baptism, the same gospel, the same forgiveness of sins. Think, Lot, Samson, David, Solomon, excellent people, full of the Holy Spirit, fell many, many times. By the way, this also refutes our Roman Catholics, Roman Catholic friends' doctrine of so-called papal infallibility and supremacy, because they say Peter was the first pope, and that the pope, when he speaks and acts, acts ex cathedra, literally from the chair, from the chair of Peter, under inspiration, without error. So much for Peter being the first pope, right? The apostles were not always inspired, only when they gave scripture. The apostles were men just like us. Notice, what was the issue that made him compromise? It was fear. What does it say in the verse here, in verse 12? Fearing them which were of the circumcision. He was afraid what they might go back and tell everyone in the Jerusalem church about him. Fear of gossip. Maybe he was afraid at what one of his family members would hear about Peter. Did you hear about Peter in Antioch, the way he's acting up there? He is. Oh, you should hear about this man. Maybe he was fear about his stand, fearful about what the church would think about him, his standing. Maybe these were men of great prestige and influence in Jerusalem. Maybe some priests that had gotten saved. Maybe some Pharisees who had publicly said they were now Christians. And Peter was worried about them. Listen, Proverbs 29 says, The fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in Yahweh and the Lord is safe. Listen, fear can lead us to deny our God and hurt his people, including ourself. It is easy to go with the tide. Even a dead dog can swim with the tide, right? It's easy to go with the flow. But to go against the tide takes faith and it takes courage and it has to say, I fear God more than men, so I'm going to do the right thing every time. Do you refuse to do the right thing because of fear? Is compromise taking over on Monday when you get to work because you're afraid what people will think if you live like Christ, if you take up the cross and follow him? Is your marriage struggling because you're afraid to grab your spouse and say, we are going to pray? Or to make the bold decision to make your children not like you and say, you are not going to be addicted to this technology in this house. See, that sometimes is fearful to do the right thing. But the fear of man lays a snare. But if you trust in the Lord, you will be safe. So, we read here these words, and I, I love what Spurgeon said. One reason why the church of God at this present moment has so little influence over the world is because the world has so much influence over the church because of fear. We're afraid to do and say the right thing. We cower over issues of human sexuality because we don't want to offend anyone. Offend anyone? We're offending God and we're hurting people when we don't tell them how God made them and who they are. We're afraid that we're going to offend somebody if we tell them, wait a minute, all roads don't lead to heaven. That Jesus is the way, not a way, the way. We don't want to hurt someone's feelings Listen to me. The lake of fire is going to hurt. Do we fear God or do we fear men? Do we fear for their very souls or are we fearful for what people think of us? Listen, our, our compromises can have significant consequences. We see in verse 13 that the Jewish Christians started to follow Peter's lead. The sins of the teacher became the sins of the followers. All of a sudden, the Jewish Christians started not to do the right thing. They started to separate. You see, your consequences, uh, your compromises might start to rub off on others around you. If Satan takes the parents out, he might take the children out. If he takes the boss out, he may take the co-workers out. If he takes the pastor out, he might take the church out. If he takes the elders out, the deacons out, he might hurt the church. If he takes the parents out, if he takes the husband out, if he takes the wife out, right? Compromises 
have consequences outside of our own hearts. So it started with the Jewish Christians, and then Paul must have said these words so painstakingly in verse 13. Even Barnabas, my friend, fellow missionary, the man who had went with me in the beginning of Galatians 2 to Jerusalem and said that the Gentiles don't need to be circumcised. They just need Jesus Christ in a new heart. Who came with me and Titus and boldly said, Titus is a Christian, bona fide, saved, born again man. Let's not judge him on the outside. Let's realize that God changes the heart. But the compromise of Peter even hurt Paul's good friend Barnabas, which may have been the beginnings of their disputes that led into Acts 15, a separation. You know, there's this story from, from the history of the United States that I think is worth telling. The year was June 1866, and the formal general, former general of the Confederacy, Robert E. Lee, was present at St. Paul's Church just after the war. Reports say to the heart of many in the congregation a well-dressed black man got up as communion time was about to start and marched to the communion table ahead of the congregation at the close of the service. Some historians believe that man was a Union soldier in civilian dress. Always before that time, very sadly in that era, black parishioners were required to take communion after the white parishioners, parishioners had taken it. And the entire church sat in stunned, paralyzed silence. The minister was frozen, unsure what to do. There was this pregnant pause felt throughout the whole church. This is quite a story. Robert E. Lee, regardless of what you think of him, what you think of the Civil War, I want you to hear this. He stood from his pew... And he walked alone to the front next to this man at the communion rail. Some of the pious church members thought he might try to usher the man away. But instead, he came up and together knelt down with that black man. And he called on the minister to take communion together with this man. And Lee's actions led the rest of the congregation to move forward and receive communion with their black brother in Christ. Some historians say that moment of Lee's actions were greater than anything he ever wrote or he ever spoke. And I would say amen to that. Probably is one of his greatest triumphant moments. You see, our compromise has great consequences, but our repentance and doing the right thing can have incredible influence, amen? So, Paul says here as he closes, When I saw they were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel, I said to Peter before them all. He went to Peter before them all publicly, and he got this thing right. He got it right. We don't serve Baal and God. We serve Yahweh. We don't serve darkness and light. We serve light. We don't serve Moses or Christ. We serve Christ. It's not law or grace. The law is needed to bring us to grace. Amen. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your ethnicity or skin color is nothing compared to Christ. We want all the ethnicities and skin colors here because we're all one family of God. Jesus is the second Adam. He's not the second Asian or the second African or the second Latino or the second Westerner. He is the second Adam. Listen, most people hate confrontation. They don't want to cause a scene, but sometimes compromise has to be addressed. I like what A.W. Tozer said, we are not diplomats, but prophets, and our message is not a compromise. It is an ultimatum. The truth alone will set you free. The chief article of our salvation was at stake. Paul did not do this flippantly. 1 Timothy 5 says we should never admit a charge against an elder unless there's two or three witnesses of evidence. And if those persist in sin, rebuke them in the presence of all so the rest may stand in fear. He had more than three witnesses. He had Barnabas. He had the Jewish Christians, the church of Antioch. And he himself was a witness. And they dealt with this thing right here at that moment. And guess what? Because they did that, the church of Antioch was saved. 
And by the way, I'll add to you that our church will be saved when we do the right thing. When we do the right thing. I love how the last words of Peter show us that Paul's rebuke over this compromise paid off. The last words of the Apostle Peter in the last chapter, he mentions old Paul. He doesn't say, I'm so bitter and angry at that guy for calling me out of my compromise. He doesn't say, oh, I wish that Paul had kept his mouth shut. That was so embarrassing. You know what he says about Paul? Count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given to you. You see, confrontation over compromise can bring restoration and healing and righteousness and make a church be the way it's supposed to be. Listen to me. I want to close with this final thought. We compromise and it brings chaos. It brings corruption. It brings sin and pain. Jesus Christ never once compromised. Jesus Christ lived the perfect, holy life you and I could never live. He was tempted in all points to be compromised, like you and me, yet without sin. He lived a perfect life so he could change our lives to look like him. That's the gospel. Next week, we're going to see that in the next sermon of how beautiful this great exchange is. Jesus lives a perfect life, no compromises, to fix our compromised, broken lives. And today, if we turn to him, if we trust in him, if we look to him, if we worship him, he will cleanse us. He will complete us. He will make us ready for the gospel war. So let's bow together and pray.